Holy shit. Holy shit. I gotta feel bad for anybody that doesn't know about the genus Puya. Now the genus Puya is a genus consistent of roughly 180 species, all South American in a family Bromeliaceae, in the larger order of grasses, Poales. Now the thing about Puyas is that, of course, they're, they're southern hemisphere, uh, you know, and only grow on the uh, South American continent. They got a northern hemisphere uh, equivalent genus Hectia, which, uh, which, you know, has the same kind of general morphology, at least of the basal rosette, uh, in being uh, very brutal and uh, uh, painful to fall into. You could see these uh, serrated uh, margins of the leaves right there. They'll uh, tear the flesh right off you. But, uh, of course, Hectia, uh, Hectia texensis is an example. You got one down there in the limestone of uh, Texas. Hectia does not have these impressive flower spikes, of course, which is the most remarkable thing about this plant. And it's probably the most impressive thing going off in this botanic garden right now. This species is native to Chile, and this is Puya berteroniana. And you can get up in there and you see those green stigmas. It's the female part. Remember, again, that's like the plant cervix. And you got those orange anthers just loaded with pollen and you got a rather big metallic blue corolla right there tree petaled corolla since it's a monocot now the thing about the some species of puya there's 180 species again in the genus not all of them have these uh, weird uh, ends that lack flowers you can see on these lateral branches on the main spike this main inflorescence you got about 10 inches on some of them where there's no flowers why would a plant not produce flowers right there that's an interesting question, and it can be answered by the fact that the thing that pollinates this is a bird in Chile, a native bird that kind of resembles a starling called the tordo. And uh, what it does, basically, is the reason that the plant doesn't produce flowers on the end is that that's an evolutionary adaptation to get that bird to come out here and hang out. It's a little, it's basically creating a perch for its pollinator. So that bird will come out, it, since it's not like a hummingbird, it can't hover, that bird will come out and it'll sit it'll sit down for a minute okay and then it just you know sticks its head in there you know gets the pollen all over its head so that tordo comes in and perches right there it sticks its head in there gets that orange pollen all over its head and uh, hopefully brings pollen from another plant that it visited earlier in the day and gets that pollen stuck on that green stigma so in a way it's you know kind of saying hey once you come down hang out for a while you know help yourself to the nectar which is down at the base of there and there is nectar on there. If you put, if you dump these things out, you could sometimes see you get a little bit of sugary water. And uh, you know, once you hang out for a minute, stick your head in there and see what's going on, and uh, maybe give me some uh, pollen from another plant. You know. Uh, so anyway, puya being uh, in the order Poales, the order of grasses, when it germinates, it just looks like a single blade. It's a monocotyledon. Uh, of course, which is one of the ways of classifying flowering plants, monocotyledons and dicotyledons. And mono and di, of course, refers to one and two, which then, of course, is a reference to the number of seed leaves they have. And Puya only has one seed leaf. So when you germinate them uh, from seed, and I've done this quite a few times, you only get one little, it looks like a little blade of grass, just like a palm tree does, you know, or a lily, etc., uh, in, you know, the first day or two of uh, germination. And then, of course, is it the, uh, continues to form you get the rosette form and eventually after you know many years of growth you get these massive clumping uh, extremely dangerous uh, I don't know what you would call that because it's so large at this point that's not a single basal rosette it's probably got 20 in there and it were you to fall in here of course you would badly injure yourself uh, probably tearing your flesh in a you know with all this uh, serrated leaf margins here and you'd come out pretty bloody it's not a fun thing to fall into but it does do the trick of discouraging herbivores from munching on it uh, that and the fact that it's uh, of course highly uh, unpalatable it's very leathery etc you need some very hard teeth but let's get back to those beautiful flowers okay so you got some nectar in there you got the nice little perches right here which are, you know, act as a spot for the pollinator to hang out before he sticks his mug in there. And then he's going to get all that uh, pollen all over himself. And then he's got the little, oh, I didn't even realize the, st the stigma's green. So the stigma right there, that's the female part. That's what receives pollen, preferably from another, the flower of another plant. Uh, the stigma's uh, bright green too. So you got nice pollinator action, uh, hot and heavy going on. It's mostly bees pollinating it right now but there was a hummingbird earlier here's another species of puya this is puya venusta also from chile and uh this is entirely one plant right here 
you can see it's just lateral offsets from the same plant and of course when you get up and look at that flower you can see that it lacks the uh if i could do this without stabbing myself in the groin you can see that it lacks the uh lateral branches of uh the puya bertaroniana over there so it's got no perch uh it's probably mostly hummingbirds doing the deed here because you can see how uh the, the opening of the corolla right there is much smaller and it's got the you know basically a long narrow pairing it going on right there or a long narrow corolla at least and uh judging the stamens are way down there too so yeah you'd need a a very long and narrow beak to get in there but uh, like i said this is puya venusta in the presence of a lateral branch is one of the diagnostic factors that separates uh it's one of the main separations uh, between the 180 plus species in the genus okay like a jackass i was filming in the uh i didn't know this pop this little population was up here this specimen i was filming in the shade so you didn't get the nice uh, you didn't get a nice view of the flowers but there you go i'll give it to you right now full frontal look at us there's a picture of the whole plant you can see uh, we're one to fall in that that would be quite painful also forgot to mention that the uh, the genus Puya, like most the bromeliads, does cam photosynthesis, which is a way uh, for plants in xeric climates to basically uh, prevent themselves from transpiring all their water through the stomata, the little holes, the little openings through which they regulate gas exchange. Uh, it prevents, it's a way for them to prevent uh, themselves from uh, transpiring all the moisture. Cacti do it too. CAM stands for Crassulacean Acid Metabolism. You might be wondering what the hell Crassulacean means. It's a reference to the family Crassulaceae, uh, which is a family of succulent plants like sedum and jade plant, then Crassula and what the shit. It, now this big bastard right here, that's Puya Raimondii. And this guy is also native to the Andes Mountains in South America. And uh, it grows at about elevations of, you know, between, I think 10,000 and 12,000 feet, maybe even higher. But it's a very high altitude plant, and unlike most other species of the genus Puya, this species is monocarpic, meaning it flowers once and then it dies. But, uh, you know, it's like an agave in that sense. But uh, it does take about, I don't know, 30 to 100 years uh, to flower. And it, when it does, it's a real banger. You could see that whole thing. It's also got those perches that the Bertaroniana has, the perches for the pollinating birds. But when this thing does flower, it's a huge spike of hundreds of uh, three-petaled, uh, mostly white and green uh, flowers. Maybe there's a little bit of yellow in there too, but they're not blue, I'll tell you that. They're not that striking. They're striking, but they're not as striking like Puya Bertaroni on it. So anyway, that's got a shit ton of seed in it, and eventually that thing's gonna fall down, and people who work here at the garden will collect a few and hopefully uh, propagate them to sell. You can see uh, the plant is dying. It's browning at the leaf ends. And uh, that one, of course, is still going. Uh, that's a younger one. It's still got to germinate. There's, it's still got to produce an inflorescence. Excuse me. And then you got variations on the theme. There's Puya chilensis with uh, entirely yellow flowers. But it's still got the perches. They're just not all shiny and blue. The flowers aren't like a Berteroni onion. But it's still got big ass, really beautiful flowers. More like a neon green Daglo thing going on, though. And now here in the sea of Alstromeria, aka the grocery store bouquet flower, very cool family though. Regardless, don't let the don't let the fact that you mostly see it in the in the Jewel Osco in a little bucket, you know, wrapped up uh, for some guy to give to his wife after he's been cheating. I don't think of don't let that uh, taint your opinion of this family. There's uh, some very cool plants in that. For, well, I think there's only a couple genera. It's only Alstromeria and Bomaria, which is a really cool uh, vine that I've seen in Mexico a bunch. It's got quite a bit of diversity down south. But this Echinopsis chiloensis in the Sea of Alstromeria is a very good uh, opportunity for me to uh, talk to you about Crassulacean acid metabolism, which uh, is a, a convergent between, uh, you know, basically cacti evolved it separately from uh, Puya. Not because they shared a common ancestor, just because they both figured out it was a nice gimmick to uh, save on moisture. And uh, basically, you're breaking up the photosynthetic process. You you open those most plants in mesic environments. Open those stomata, those little. Uh, they look like a coin purse that you know they're closing up, and they uh, most plants do that at least in mesic environments. Say like in Iowa or something, where you got more moisture. They do it during the day at the same time that they're bringing in uh, the gas. You know they they open those stomata to bring in gas at the same time 
that they're photosynthesizing. With Crassulaceae and Asa metabolism though, they, the plants break it up a little bit. So you got plants like cacti and uh, bromeliads like the Puya that uh, basically they, what they do is they open up their stomata at night when it's cooler and they're not in the heat of the sun and they're not going to transpire as much moisture because when you're letting in those, uh, when you're opening those stomata to let in the CO2, you're also losing moisture which you want to keep. But if you do it at night, it's a little bit easier. You're not going to lose as much moisture. So they store, the, they take the carbon dioxide in at night, store it in the form of malic acid, and uh, then shut their stomata when the sun comes out during the day, and then uh, and then complete the photosynthetic process. They use a the malic acid to uh, complete the complete the photosynthetic process and uh, produce those much needed carbohydrates, uh, which is the energy source for nearly every living thing. Uh, and uh, and that's how they do it, you know, they break it up. That's an oversimplified version of CAM photosynthesis, Crassulacean acid metabolism. You want to really blow your mind, look up C4 photosynthesis. Now that's a pain in the ass. Lastly, here's another species of Puya. This one unnamed. Apparently whoever collected it uh, wasn't able to name it or identify it. And you can see it's got very long corollas right there. It's probably pollinated by hummingbirds since it lacks a perch and also just by the general shape of these corollas they're very elongated and the uh, and the opening's not too big so it's not really big enough for a, a bird's head to get in there it's got to be a long narrow beak of one of the uh you know couple hundred different species of uh, hummingbird that uh, live in south america and you can see the basal rosette it's a lot more uh filiform too it's like thread like this goddamn these these leaves they still got those painful serrated margins but they're much thinner much narrower uh, but again they uh, they form a uh, huge mat that's roughly the size of a small sedan